Father, we, uh, we thank you for the privilege it is to be gathered together, uh, to hear your word uh, read to us, uh, to sing praise to you, to be prayerful together. We thank you for all these wonderful blessings as your people. And we do ask, particularly now as we look at your word, that you might give us wisdom and insight, that you might please, by your spirit, touch us deeply, transform and change us, grow us into the image of Christ, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my hope this morning is to tackle a massively contentious issue in our political context. We're going to talk about the voice. Have you heard of the voice? I don't mean the TV show. Um, I mean, uh, a friend of mine was saying that actually he had a bunch of teenagers around, teenage, those teenagers, he had a bunch of young adults around and, uh, some months ago and he was asking their opinion on the voice. And he said all I could think of was to talk about the singing and the judging and what was happening. And so, are are you all aware we've got a big vote coming in the next three or four weeks? The voice? Yep, good, the voice department. um, It's regarded by many people as perhaps the most important decision we will make as a country for decades. It really is uh, held to be in very high importance. And so I did think it important to say something about it. But I want to first consider the passage set down for us today, uh, particularly that verse, chapter 50, uh, verse 19 and 20, um, the last chapter of the book of Genesis. I want to do that because I think if we, if we get our heads into Genesis again and kind of finish up, we're trying to wrap it up together this morning. We'll come back to Genesis the next two weeks, uh, go back into a few different parts of the Bible. But um, this is kind of the, the aim of t- today is to kind of pull it all together. Uh, my hope is that if we look at Genesis, we'll be better able to make a comment on the voice. So that's where we're going. Grab your Bible, Genesis chapter 50. I want to show you the most remarkable and extraordinary voice, verse, voice, chapter 50, verse 19. Let me read it for you. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid, am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Now, is that not an astonishing verse? I'm going to keep saying voice all the way through. Isn't that an astonishing verse? Um, You intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Now, what's the it there? What's the you intended it for evil, for harm? What's the it that's being referred to? the selling into slavery of Joseph. Uh, So you remember the context, if you were here last week, you'll have some sense of this, but uh, we've been going through the account of Joseph that's been going for the last 13 chapters, beginning back at chapter 37. Joseph, the man who's speaking, he was one of 12 brothers. Uh, He was the favourite of his father. The other 11 brothers hated him because of it. He had a dream uh, that all 11 of his brothers would bow down to him and uh, worship him, and the sun, the moon, and the stars would worship him as well. And showing that he had a lot of growing up to do, he decided to share that with his brothers, the brothers who were jealous of him and hated him, which uh, just fueled them some more. Actually, there's a lesson right there. You don't have to share every thought that comes into your head with people. Right? There's some things you're better not to say. But uh, Joseph uh, hadn't learned that lesson. Well, they decided enough was enough, and they determined to kill him. And in the context of uh, setting about doing that, uh, Reuben came in and they decided to actually not kill him but sell him into slavery. And so they sold him to merchants going into Egypt um, and this was the thing they intended, to get rid of him, uh, to sell him into slavery in their jealousy and hatred. But that very event, we're told in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, you intended harm in that, but God astonishingly, intended it to happen as well. Intended that very thing to happen, but he intended it for good. And right here is this incredible insight into what life is like living in the world that God, the God of Genesis 1 and 2, has made. And it's God's intention to actually teach you this very thing. See, what is life like living in this world, the world that God has created? There is no power in the universe that rivals God. 
He is the creator, the one who made everything from nothing, by a mere word, by voicing a desire. All that exists came into being. He is over all powers. He is outside of all things, beyond all things. He is the great, sovereign Lord of the universe, the creator. But he isn't absent. It's not as if he's aloof and distant. He is at work in his creation, in this interaction and every interaction. He is beneath all things, behind and over, sovereignly purposing all that occurs, making it happen, whilst at the same time, the humans that he has made in his image are also at work, choosing what they choose, deciding what they decide of their own volition. It's their choice, their determination to make things happen. And what we're taught here in Genesis chapter 50 is the most astonishing truth that in the one event, we can be intending and purposing and choosing to make things happen of our own volition and freedom. At the very time that God is at work choosing it to happen and choosing us to choose, sovereignly purposing that thing. His power is so great, He can rule the actions of creatures who are themselves in charge of their actions. Proverbs, from memory, Proverbs 21, the heart of the king is in the Lord's hand, He turns it as He wills, like a watercourse. The Proverbs takes, who is the most powerful agent in humankind? The king. Well, that very one God rules over. So that every thought of his heart, every intention of his life is purposed by God as well. This is an astonishing verse. It reveals a truth, a a deep deep and uh, profound truth beyond actually human understanding. Because logic would tell us that if we're truly making our own choices, if we're truly agents who have our own volition and freedom, then God can't be in control of what we do. Because that surely would undermine our freedom. But this passage says, no, 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 the two are true at the same time. Now, how can it be so? Well, it's the power of God. We have too small a thought of who God is. You see, God is the God who works out all things according to the purpose of His will, everything. How's that so? You see, when we think about being in charge of something, controlling something, the only way we can think of being totally in control of something is is if it's a, um, you're not happy with this teaching, is that what? there brother Um, the the only way that we can actually be in control of something is if it has no will of its own it's a puppet it's inanimate and then we can control it but uh, and so we imagine if God is in control of human decisions and what we're doing and so on it must be because we have no uh, will of our own you see that makes that's what makes sense to us but the Bible says it's other than that now how to get a sense of it well I would offer there is a way in which we can get some sense of this idea we can to some measure, control creatures who have their own will. Think of the owner of a dog, as long as it's not a beagle, <laughs> which is the dog we have. But, you know, there's some dogs that, you can, that have their own will and their own determination, yet you can control what they want and how they do what they do, to some degree. You can get a sense of that. Well, multiply that up massively, and you get the sense of my power over an animal, but the sovereign creator of all things over a human is so vast and great, that he has the ability to control every thought, every determination, every decision of the king's heart, my heart, and yet not in any way diminish my freedom to make my choices. This truth is so important uh, that this part of the Bible, this first book of the Bible, lays the foundations to help us see who God is. This is God introducing himself to his world. He is the creator from nothing. He is the sovereign Lord of the universe who wants a relationship with you. But this is the same God who is sovereignly working every detail. And this part of the Bible spends a massive amount of time on this issue. We're told about Joseph's ups and downs. Uh, he is sold into slavery. Chapter th- he's sold into slavery, chapter 37. But God is with him in it. And so that he lifts him up to be the head of the household that he's sold into, Potiphar's house. He's accused of rape in chapter 39, he's thrown into prison, he's cast down into prison. But the Lord God is with him in that as well and lifts him up to be the head of the prison. 
And then he's released in chapter 41 of Genesis to be made the head of all of Egypt, the greatest power in the ancient world, second only to Pharaoh. How? Well, because of a series of happenstances. Pharaoh has a dream given to him by God, it needs to be interpreted. And his chief cupbearer uh, was himself once in prison with a man who was able to interpret his dreams that came true, given by God, a man called Joseph. And so because of that relationship, he's able to bring him to Pharaoh and introduce Joseph to Pharaoh. So that in chapter 41, Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams about a famine for seven years in the land. And verse 40 of chapter 41, Pharaoh makes Joseph the head of all of Egypt, under him, only second to him. Now, how does Joseph get there? By God's sovereign hand. By God giving the dream and working the choices and decisions and circumstances of the cupbearer being there and God working behind the happenstance and seemingly random decisions and choices and disasters. God is revealed through all of this to be at work and at all working His purposes. You meant it to bring harm, you meant it for evil, says Joseph. But God worked in exactly that same incident. He purposed it. He meant it for good, a greater good. You know, this book is written to introduce humanity to God, the God of Israel, to bring to us a truth about this God, that He is the God who rules, who is over all things and is in all things. And this, of course, plays out in the most important event in human history, the event of Jesus, who is the culmination of all of these things. You see, Jesus, Jesus is crucified. Think with me about evil. What is the most evil event that has happened in human history? There's a large list you could draw from. The Holocaust was pretty bad. But you think about it. I I remember when I was converted as a late teenager and, um, uh, you know, told of this funny little story to convey, and it's somewhat childish, but, you know, the idea of aliens coming to earth and asking uh, about, um, you know, what's happened in your world that's been amazing, and someone says, well, we had the Son of God come to us, and the alien says, you had God, the God of the universe, come and visit you? What did you do when God came amongst you? Did you laud Him with, did you praise Him? Did you... Well, actually, we crucified Him. And in that little story is this sense of the horror of what we have done in human history. The greatest evil act of rebelling against our Creator, the One who has made us all. And yet, in that very event, God is at work. Come with me to Acts chapter 2. Come with me to Acts chapter 2. Keep your finger there in Genesis. Acts chapter 2. This is the Apostle Peter after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And in chapter 2, verse 22, listen to what he says... Fellow Israelites, listen to this, Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This is history. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. God intended the most evil act in human history to happen. He intended the betrayal and crucifixion of his son. But look what he goes on to say, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Do you see what's being said by the apostle? You intended to harm, but in that very act of you handing him over by your choice and freedom of will in your evil act, by your act of evil, God actually intended that whole event but purposed it for good, the salvation of humanity, the ability for God now to righteously judge sin and yet forgive sinners. You see, all of this is to say this morning, come and see your God. He is not passive and absent from His world. He cannot be thwarted or stopped. His purposes can't be undone. Human hostility and apathy towards God cannot undo God. 
the atheist who shakes his fist at God as if somehow we can, we can judge him and cast him off. When you understand the truth of who God is, it's a pathetic weakness to imagine that you can throw God off. He is sovereign even over your rebellion. Whilst at the same time, human rebellion is entirely culpable. You are responsible and rightly judged and condemned. Human hostility and apathy cannot undo God. Satanic forces cannot undermine God. The futility of opposition towards this God. And at the same time, the full responsibility of human in their opposition. Do you see the two things wound together in the Scriptures? Which creates, I want to suggest for us, great confidence and care. We can be confident that God will fulfill His every promise. We can be confident that if we are in His hands, we will never be left, lost, taken. He is the God who sovereignly rules and will fill His purposes. Confidence and care. You are responsible. To stand against this God, you will not escape. You will be held accountable. This is not fatalism. This is the sovereign power of God and human responsibility bound together. But this is far more than a uh, static insight into the theology of who God is. You know, it's not like it's just here is a truth about God, though it is that. What we have here in Genesis 50 is also the history of God's activity in the world, His purposes to do something to use his sovereign power for a purpose. And that purpose, come back to Genesis 50. What's that purpose? Put so wonderfully and briefly by Joseph, verse 19, don't be afraid, am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You see, what you have in the book of Genesis is not just a, an introduction to God in who He is, it's an introduction to God in what He's doing, what He's about in the world. Let me take you through it. The first 11 chapters of Genesis. Uh, we, we, we have recorded for us God creating and human rebellion and sin in the fall. But what you have in those first 11 chapters, I don't know if you've noticed this, but as you read through the first 11 chapters, you get repeated series of human uh, sin and rebellion and every time human sin and rebellion is drawn attention to a couple of things follow God judges he mitigates the sin consequence and he works salvation promises salvation and so each episode of sin you see this same pattern where God mitigates judges and works salvation It happens all the way through the first 11 chapters until one episode of sin where the pattern's broken. It's the episode of chapter 11 where you find the Tower of Babel, where human pride gathers together to build a tower to reach up to God uh, in their, their, their pride and sin and God judges them but there's no reference to mitigation or to to uh salvation being saved and all the others but not this one. It's left hanging until chapter 12, where we're introduced to Abram. And we're meant to see in the introduction of Abram, this fulfilment of the pattern, where God judges, mitigates and begins salvation. But with Abram, it's the beginning of salvation for the world. Because God makes a series of promises to Abraham that he'll be Abraham's God, he'll enter into a relationship with Abraham that's deep and profound. Uh, He'll bless Abraham, he'll make him into a great nation, Uh, he will will make his name great, he'll give him a home and a land to live in and he will make, through Abraham, blessing come to the world. And so you have God's purpose now revealed to bring salvation and the rest of the book of Genesis begins to um, reveal those promises being fulfilled and what follows is a focus on Abraham and his descendants 
Abraham's sons, but one particular son, Isaac, is focused on. Abraham, Isaac has sons and one of Isaac's sons, Jacob, is focused on. So we deliberately focus on one line all the way down. Jacob, whose name changes to Israel, has 12 sons. But the big focus on the last quarter of the book of Genesis is on only one of those sons, Joseph. And it begs the question, why? Why does the book of Genesis spend so much of its time on Joseph? From chapter 37 to chapter 50. Is it just that Joseph is really interesting and the other brothers aren't? Is it that Joseph has lots of miraculous things happen in his life, whereas the other brothers don't? Why so much attention on Joseph? Well, because there's a message being given through Joseph. What you see in Joseph is the deliberate plan of God unfolding. Driven by those great promises of God in Genesis chapter 12. To make him a great nation, to create a great relationship, to have a place where they could be at home, to bring blessing to the world. What you find in Genesis is that God steps into human history, visibly if you like, he's always in history, but visibly shows himself in this family and these events because these events are central to his purposes to save, to save the world, to save this family because this family is special and to bring blessing through this family. So chapter 47, Egypt is blessed through the blessing of Joseph. Chapter 50, the family is blessed through Joseph, where reconciliation of brothers occurs, where, where they are brought into Egypt now to become a great nation. They come as 70 now, with many more around them. And so what you find with Genesis is one of those promises beginning to be fulfilled in anticipation of the other promises. The book of Genesis ends with the insight that they will go back from Egypt to the promised land, to the land that God had said. And so the whole thing moves forward. God is moving forward things towards His great plan to bless the world. Do you see? All of this is anticipating a greater blessing and fulfilment when God Himself is born into this family who comes to create a great new family which is by faith alone, not works. A family established with the merits of God's Son who dies in our place. For a relationship where we are taken to a new home, the promised land, which is not back to Israel, but it's the new Jerusalem, the heavenly creation. Now, do you see how any of this relates to the voice? In the mess of so many things in life, lots of stuff happens in our life. There's lots of brothers and siblings of Abraham. But in the mess of it all, there are some things that sit at the centre as of greater importance. Genesis is written to focus on a particular few things. So much else is ignored. And it focuses on a few particular core things, the things that will build towards the event of the great salvation, the coming of the great saviour, the one who is the fulfilment of Joseph and all the hopes, the seed to which the promise is referred. It's all focused on the coming of Jesus, who will reverse the fall, save us to be in relationship with God by faith alone, to live in relationship with God into a new creation, the new heavens and the new earth, the heavenly city, to be taken home. And the Bible focuses on one line and one movement and one person, Jesus, because in the midst of so many things, there's one big thing that eclipses them all. And that's the big thought here. You know, everything in life does matter in some sense. All the little things you do are important. Um, Your parenting, pick that. I was reminded this week of a quote by Martin Luther, who was the great reformer from the 1500s, and um, 
he, uh, he was a very down-to-earth kind of man who was deeply spiritual and he was pushing back against the mind of the, that time where the only job that was significant and meaningful and important was the priest or the monk or the nun and so on. You had to leave your... And, you know, you ought not get consumed with parenting, with the nappies and all the, you know, the buying of the food and the cooking in the house. You ought to be sort of meditating and that's the... Luther pushed back against that and said this, God with all his angels and creatures is smiling, not because that father is washing diapers, but because he is doing so in Christian faith. Now that's a very interesting verse for a couple of, uh, statement for a couple of reasons. Firstly, in the 1500s, fathers were washing diapers. Notice that. We got it right since then and changed, of course, but that, uh, that was a joke, that was a joke. But... Um, But what's interesting in that quote is that Luther makes the point, the very helpful point, that when a father changes a diaper and he does it as someone who is seeking to please his God, God smiles at it. It's an act of great worth and significance. Mothers and fathers, as you work in the mess of life and all the the difficulties and and, uh, routine and pain, as you do all and any unto the Lord, it is very significant, it is meaningful. But there are some things more central than others. Some things are more centrally connected to eternal matters and Genesis shows us this. God revealed himself to Pharaoh in a dream about a famine that would take seven years and cause starvation around the world. Why did God do that for Pharaoh then? Is this what God does just for social needs around the world? No, no, no. Because at that time, he needed the famine to bring the family into Egypt to be fed, to become a great nation in the protection of Pharaoh, to go back because of this family. Because this family was the family that is central to God's purposes to bring a saviour, the seed, to the world. The Bible reveals God is working in everything, in all circumstances. But he also... God makes the point that some works, his visible public works, are given to highlight the central movement of God's purposes. You see, around all that's happening is this big thing, God's determination to seek and save the lost, to bring people out from his righteous judgment on the last day. To save people from eternal condemnation. That is the big thing. To bring people into relationship with himself, restored and renewed. To live a life saved from sin in its fullness where they reflect the image of Christ in life now and await his return. This means, brothers and sisters, that many things we care about in our days, many things we ought to care about, aren't central and it matters that we keep this distinction clear. Everything matters but some things matter more. You know, years ago uh, I might have used this illustration with you, I'm I, sorry, I have used this illustration, about a rock, the rocks in a jar. Let me give it to you again because some of you have not heard it. Um, there was a, apparently a business uh, leader who uh, had a whole conference of CEOs and and financial managers and all this kind of stuff in a conference and he had up the front a big jar and uh, full of rocks in the jar to the top and he asked the question of the business leaders there, do you think the jar's full? And uh, smart as they are, they said, no, 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 you could fit more things in and so he got some gravel and tipped the gravel into the jar and the gravel broke it down and around amongst all the gaps between the rocks and filled it all the way up to the top. Is it full now, he said. And some said, oh, and others said, no, no, no. He got a bucket of sand and tipped the sand into the jar and the sand sprinkled down amongst the gaps between the rocks and the gravel and filled it all up to the top. Is it full now? Some people said, yes. Others said, no, you're right, it's not. And then he got a bucket of water and tipped the water into the jar and it filled it. Is it full now? And everyone said, yes, it's now full. Then he said to the gathered group of professionals who have come to get developed in their work life, he came and he said to them, what's the moral of the story? What's the moral of the illustration? What's the point? What do you think the point is? Don't say anything. What's the point? Well, someone yelled out, 
Just when you think your life is full, you can always fit something more in. He said, no, no, the moral of the story is, if you don't put the rocks in first, you'll never get them in. That's good, isn't it? If you put the sand and gravel in first, you'll never fit the rocks in. And he made the point to a group of business leaders, the men and women gathered, he said, if you don't put the rocks into your life first, the business of life will crowd your life out so that you'll never fit them in. And then he put to them the question, what are the rocks? Because if you don't pause and think about what the rocks are, you'll never put them in, you'll never keep them in, and it'll all get crowded out so that you'll come to the end of your days with no room for the rocks. Now, what are the rocks? What are the rocks of life? That you might be saved eternally. That you might be brought into a living relationship with the God of the universe. That you might not suffer eternal condemnation. You can gain everything in this world, but if you forfeit your soul, says Jesus, what has been gained? There is nothing that matters like you being established in relationship with God. To live a life that pleases and honours God. To live a life of godliness and holiness, waiting for His Son from heaven. Do you see what the rocks are? The point of this is that not everything in life is a rock. There are many things that are different. And it's important that you be clear on what they are. And we've been given the Bible so that we know what the rocks are in life. And we need one place in the world where you can come and be taught clearly and kept clear on what the rocks are. Because there's nowhere else in life that will teach you what the rocks are. They'll just keep teaching you about the sand and the gravel and the water. And your life will get filled up. Do you know what that one place should be? The church. Church is meant to be a place where you come every week hearing pastoral leaders who keep pointing you to the rocks of your life, urging you to see what matters most. And our world needs church to be focused on the rocks because there's nowhere else that will do it. And when churches slip away from talking about the rocks and begin to talk about the gravel and the sand and the water, people's lives get filled up with everything else and there's no rooms to fit the rocks in. The rocks, the big and small rocks, the rocks are gospel things, the need of salvation, the way of salvation in Christ alone, not by works, the life of being saved, the life of godliness and holiness, the hope of a new creation, these are the rocks. There might be other rocks that are smaller, the rocks, they're rocks nonetheless, the rocks of ethical principles, the needs of the poor in society, these are rocks. Concerns of the oppressed and weak, these are rocks, but not as big, but they're rocks. And we need somewhere, every week, where God's heart for what matters most is championed, for your eternal health and well-being. Now, the voice. What is the voice? Is it a rock or a bit of sand? Actually, not just what is the voice, but whether you vote Liberal or Labor, is that a rock or sand? Well, whether you vote Greens, that's clearly a rock, isn't it? I mean, that's not... But what are we to say about your political vote each time the, the elections come up? Are they rocks? Actually, another way of asking this is, should the church preach on politics? Should the church be a place that tells you how you should vote on election day? On referendums? The answer to that question is, yes. The The answer to that question is, yes, sometimes. Very rarely, so yes, no's right, good too. But um, should we preach about politics? Sometimes, but rarely. When, when a political issue is clearly a rock, or so close to being a rock that it directly impacts the rocks, 
It impacts our ability to get the rock in the jar. We need to speak to it. And let me speak plainly and stop using the metaphor. When a political issue is a salvation issue or so closely aligned to a matter of eternal significance that it impacts people's eternity, that it impacts our ability to, be, to live God-honouring lives, we need to speak. When it's an ethical issue of such seriousness that it's so close to the heart of God for humanity, we need to speak about it. But even there, we need to be clear, care, take care. Because what we might think is clearly an ethical principle might just be less clear when you're talking policy. See, see think with me about this. this is, it is complex. Some political issues are clearly not rocks. I've always thought that Terrigal Haven should have a 50-metre rock pool. Agreed? I mean, why, why don't we have the entrance here? It's just, I find it insanity. The place is begging for a rock pool to be built there. Now, that's a political issue, and I'm going to start preaching on it. <laughs> Good idea or bad idea? I can have my opinion, but I'm not going to... That's not a rock to preach. What a stupid thing for a church to be involved in, do you see? It's obviously not something we should preach on. But if legislation is introduced into Parliament that empowers the government to remove welfare provisions for the poorest in our society, we need to speak. You see. If a, referendum, if a referendum is raised where we are asked to remove Indigenous Australians from citizenship of Australia, we should speak. Because these trigger such closely aligned principles, do you see? But which is the voice? Is it clearly not politically, is it clearly not a rock or is it clearly a rock? Which is the voice? I think the principles behind it are rocks, but the actual referendum question? Whoa, I don't know. Let me try and explain this. You see, the rock of um, care for the Indigenous population of Australia... That is an ethical principle of God's love for the oppressed, the weak, the vulnerable. And Christians ought to preach to that and care about that. And you, brothers and sisters, should care about the weakest in our society. It should be a great concern for you, a great grief to you, that Indigenous Australians are so poorly, that the representation in prison and health, you ought to be deeply concerned about that. Are you? You need to be. But will saying yes to this referendum question, solve that problem. That's a matter of debate. The principle's clear, and I trust all fair-minded people agree with the principle, but some will argue that it will solve it, some will argue it won't. Should the church enter into that discussion? That's not where we have our expertise. I don't know. Well, I have my opinion, but I'm not going to preach it to you. You see, the principles we preach to, racism, the church must speak out against racism. We are all one. God has made every race one human kind. And we ought to condemn any occasion where people, the full humanity of one race is, is destroyed. We ought to condemn that. Anything that disadvantages one race because of their race over another, we ought to oppose but is this question that? Some of you think it is. Some of you are sure it's not. I can't tell you which it is, but I can tell you about racism and I can tell you about the oppressed. We preach principles and take care not to imagine that we can work out where government policy is clearly destroying the principle. You see what I'm trying to say here? Now, sometimes the government policy is so closely attached to the principle, we do need to speak to it. For instance... Um, the euthanasia bill just so clearly speaks to the problem that we need to speak. So we had a whole night on that. The, 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 the question of the um, suppression of conversion uh, that's coming into the New South Wales Parliament, that so clearly undermines a critical piece of human life together that we need to speak about it. And we've sent you some material on that. But we need to stay out of the vast majority of legislation pieces because we aren't equipped to actually decide on what principle they really are. It's just, it's far more complex. Christians will disagree. You see, whether you vote yes or not, no in this referendum 
It's not a rock. And so as a church, we will not divide over it. If you are voting no, if you would think to vote no, you are welcome here. I'm saying that because I think probably many of you will. You're welcome here because if you love the Lord Jesus and you vote no, we love you. If you're thinking to vote yes, you are welcome here if you love the Lord Jesus. Because we're united in Christ and not our vote for this. You need the church to stay out of the particulars and speak to the principles as far as it's able unless those principles get so well, you hear what I'm saying. We need a place in the world, one place that keeps our heads clear that helps us see what rocks really are, that keeps speaking to us about eternal matters, matters that are far more central, issues of godliness and holiness, matters that are far more important than whether you vote Liberal or Labor. Especially given the case that at one time in history, we we are so passionate about something, we are sure it's a principle, when in 20 years' time later we go, it really wasn't. We need great wisdom. Do you know, there's an episode in the book of Joshua where Joshua was near Jericho and he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand and Joshua went up to him and said, are you for us or for our enemies? And the the man said, neither. I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. Are you for me is what matters. You see... We are not a branch of the Liberal Party or the Labor Party. We are captives to the Lord God Himself. His kingdom is not of this world. We live in this world and we ought to do it as citizens who are full of love and grace and compassion and honour our God. But this is not home. And you need a place every week to come and be reminded that this isn't our home. We're aliens and strangers here. Our only hope is the Lord Jesus. He's the one that matters. And that we bring to the world, the news of Christ is the great thing that we speak to. Which therefore means, brothers and sisters, what you use your money for is what we call you to. Will you use your money for your holidays, for your home improvements, for your new car, for, for edu- will you, or will you use your money to advance the great cause, the central cause that the whole Bible is focused on, the salvation of men and women from hell, establishing them in relationship with God? What is your life centred on? What's the rock and how does that shape what you do and how you do it? Vote well, vote responsibly, think about all the ins and outs, but keep clear what the rocks are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do ask, please, that you might give us clarity and force us, cause us to, to have clarity. Help us as a church be a place that for, for, for generations to come is focused on the rocks, that we might speak to those political issues where necessary, but that, Lord, rather we would week by week remind ourselves of the place of Christ, the importance of Christ, the centrality of Jesus, the importance of seeking first your kingdom, and your righteousness, that these might be our rallying cry together and the thing that unites us together. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.